The metaverse is emerging as the next big technology platform and promises to be the next frontier for human experiences on the internet. Into the Metaverse covers companies, technologies, and trends that are bringing these promises to life. Join creator and host Jonathan Ross Friedman, founder and CEO of SuperSocial, as he interviews the brilliant minds that are building, shaping, and investing in the Metaverse. Welcome to Into the Metaverse, where we help make sense of the Metaverse through deep conversations with the brilliant minds who build, create for, and invest in the Metaverse. I'm Jan, and joining me today is Richard Ward, who was head of Metaverse at McKinsey, and in January, will be starting a new career as venture altruist. Richard, I'm delighted to welcome you on Into the Metaverse. Thank you very much. I mean, given that intro, it looks like I'm in august company, so I'll try and say something clever. I'm sure you will. So let's dig in. As we continue to build an evolving consensus around what the Metaverse is, the first question I ask each guest that comes on the show, for you, what is the Metaverse? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think what we have is a gap between expectation and delivery reality at the moment. And usually the way this gets characterized is that somebody says, hey, you know, we want to do something in the metaverse, right? And you say, okay, great. And you say, well, you know, if you mean something like this, so a headset based thing where it's true 3D graphics, stereoscopic, immersive reality, you do say, well, you do realize there's only about 15 million headsets out there. And by the way, at least a third of them are sitting in a drawer doing nothing. So it's probably a really small market. And then you start slicing the market out and say, rest of the world versus the United States, demographics, da, 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 da. and the numbers get start getting really small, right? And in fact, Jan, you deal with brands, large brands all the time. And so large brands like, mm, you know, we need to address a fairly sizable audience to be worth our while. I mean, that sort of a thing. And so then, you know, then what happens is that people then move the goalposts and they say, well, what about Roblox? What about Fortnite? What about Minecraft? They've got hundreds of millions of users. That seems like a consumer oriented brand size market that we'd like to go to. And I always say, look, you can, but let's be clear. That's kind of not really the metaverse. And I mean that from the following. If you imagine what we've been promised over the years for what the metaverse and what the metaverse experience has been, and I always ask people this question, say, hey, imagine it's five years in the future. Let's imagine that we're like two generations of headsets in the future and software network and blah, blah, blah. It's Friday night. You and five of your friends in four different countries decide that you're going to hang out in the metaverse on a Friday night. What are you going to do? Now, tell me the story. And the stories. 80% of them sound something like this. Well, me and my five friends, okay, so massive multiplayer networking, <clears throat> are going to go to a discotheque on a space station in the rings of Saturn. And there's going to be like a space dolphin as the DJ. And we're all going to like dance and have fun and maybe play some games and do that. Yeah, so, and I would say, great, I got it. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. Your physical body, Remember, this is five years in the future. It's Friday night, you and your friends. Your physical body, you're in your space discotheque with a dolphin DJ and your friends. Are you doing something that looks like this? Or do you have a smartphone and you're doing something that looks like this where you're, you know, you're just twiddling your thumbs on a piece of glass? And the answer is always, well, Richard, we thought we'd be like dancing. And so for me... That right there is the fact that the concept of the metaverse cannot be really separated from full body computing, right? The idea that moving of your heads and moving of your hands and all those sorts of things, that's the next frontier we're really working on. That we went from mainframes to PCs. So we went from giant machines in the company to a, a computer at your house, right? And it had big old de gray beige desktops, right? to then somewhat mobile computing with luggable computers with laptops where you can take it anywhere, to then truly mobile computing. I mean, super powerful computers in our pockets. But to then the next generation or the next iteration of this is what I call full body computing, which is where if I turn my head or move my hands, these things matter for the compute environment, right? And as such, I realize I'm not right, but I always say you cannot spell metaverse without VR. That truly is the part that we're trying to create a next entire experience in computing environment and all that sort of stuff. And as such, I say, look, it's early days. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, Zuckerberg yelled metaverse 
And I'm sorry, everybody got all excited, but I'm not the one who said this stuff is ready today and that the audience sizes are there and that sort of stuff. Now, the flip side of that is, well, okay, but what does that mean? I said, well, but the other thing, so things like creating experiences in Roblox or Minecraft or any of those things, use those as building blocks to understand how things like interactions work and how, you know, that moving from the 2D world of creating a video or an ad campaign or something like that, that's pretty static, right? The audience doesn't have a lot of participation back in it and interactivity and all that stuff. Great. Use these 2.5D systems to kind of get started, to build a team, to understand that. So that then as the number of truly 3D people and the real metaverse come into reasonable sizes, you've got a group of people that know how this stuff works. It's kind of like getting into that. So very long answer to a short question, but for me, very clearly, the promise of the metaverse really was the matrix and ready player one and lawnmower man and all that sort of stuff. That it was that my physical body can be someplace else with other people doing things in a true full body way, right? And that was the promise. And we've still got a lot of work to do that. Anything less than that is not less in the sense of less valuable, but it is should be assumed as a building block or a learning step to get to the full thing. And just to clarify, because I think I'm sure the, the typical person would listen to what you just said about full body computing, which obviously is a paradigm shift, right? Being fully embedded and immersed in something where technology is fully around us and we feel it, maybe even smell it. <laughs> But just to Actually, I don't think you need to go that far. I think it's just, it's truly, because for example, if you took a highly simplified version of a human being, what it looks like is you have a brain, you have two eyes, because my understanding is that 70 to 80% of the inputs to the brain are visual. That the inputs that are coming in for who you are and how you perceive the world is visual. And then what you have off of the brain is two hands that our hands are actually highly intensive compute centers for sending out information and receiving thereof. So if you have eyes, brain, hands, looks a lot like one of these to me. And so it's hacking the system and you're getting most of it. Now you can add other things. So people are talking about haptics and smell and temper. Great, you can add all of that stuff. But I think for sort of a 80% solution, a system that keeps recomputing frame rates in front of your eyes and takes input from the feedback of your full body, right? Which is mostly your hands and arms. You know, you get like an 80% solution. So here's a question, because a lot of what you're talking about, this full body computing really puts us in the premise of there is compu com computational interfaces around us and we're fully embedded in it. How does that in yeah. fit into what I think is also very important in the conversation about the metaverse that we are not building a purely virtual realm that is disconnected from real life. How does technologies like augmented reality and the ability to overlay virtual content or digital content in our physical surrounding, how does that fit into the way you're thinking about the metaverse as full body computing? Well, so it completely can work because really what, you know, let's say mixed reality, if you will, is you can imagine a dial that goes all the way from zero, which is what we have right now. There's no mediated pixel mm -hmm. intercepting my you know, the photons coming into my retina now, all the way to turning the dial to 100% where every pixel is computer generated. And you'd say, well, right, you know, those mixed reality pass through systems, right? It's 100% generated pixels, but they are taking inputs from the analog system to align them to waveguides, which is gonna be analog photons with digital pixels integrated into it. So that's kind of in the 50%, 30%, 20% world, right? You know, those types of things. So it's really just kind of like a turning the dial, but it's there, there's that question of what's the interactivity of the body and the turning and all of that. That's the part that I'm talking about. And I think that truly, really, I think also, by the way, the AR people and community, what they're really trying to do is hands-free computing. Right. That really, you know, this idea of, oh, it's going to be what's after the smartphone. It's like, OK, well, I'm just going to have basically everything my smart smartphone does, but I don't have to have a piece of glass in my hand to do the inputs. Mm -hmm. That in a way, that's the majority, I think, of what they're really working on. And that 
and that there will be some sort of slam like environmental reactionary understanding of what's going on with it and those kinds of things. But the biggest problem with all that is that super intense compute, you know, compute intensive and intensive compute equals heat. And so you run into the fact that it's hard to put like very, you know, if you have camera systems running, video systems running full time to gather the data to be able to calculate SLAM, right? 5G modems running to be talking to the server and back full time. Um, then you're gonna have to have compute CPU and GPU systems to calculate the next frame, right? And then laser based or other systems to generate out the photons to push it back into your eyes. All of those things use electricity, which means they have waste heat. And so that's one of the big things that you need to manage. And then you're also going to need a big battery to generate all the electricity that you need to do all of these things. So if you start to pull back some of the things, okay, well, we're going to have the laser-based waveguide systems running at a certain frame rate and a certain field of view, because the bigger the field of view and the more the frame rate, the hotter the laser is going to get, right? And then you say, well, what if we're able to like do kind of like what AMD and various others have done with the chips sets where they make them more efficient, the pipelines reduce the electrical capacity, which means reduces the heat. By the way, have you ever taken a brand new modern gaming laptop and fire that thing up to full speed and put it on your lap with no cloth on you? I and mean, it'll burn you, right? And then you say, okay, well, then maybe from the networking standpoint, do we run to like a lower power Wi-Fi connection locally or some other system for that? Maybe, right? Then you run to like for the cameras for figuring out SLAM by using neural networks. But again, that's a computing trade-off. Can we lower the frame rate, reduce the number of cameras, or maybe go to alternative lower power sensors like LiDAR systems or something like that to gather the, you know, and basically all of these things is reducing the compute and the energy requirements because it's going to require, you know, reduce the heat requirements because otherwise you're going to be running around with a car battery to run this thing and a radiator on yeah. your head. And, any, and anyone that has put even an Oculus Quest on them for 15, 20 minutes will know exactly what you're talking about. And I think... You know, as a side note, a lot of people are looking at what Zuckerberg is doing with Meta and the investments. And some people, many people say, oh my God, this is so much money. And then I'm listening to you and our audience is listening to this as well. And I'm thinking he's probably not investing enough because he's going to have to compete against yeah, some of the biggest companies work. in the world, like Microsoft and Apple, who potentially are spending even more money than he is on their quote unquote yeah. metaverse computational initiatives. These are hardcore material science, electrical engineering physics problems, right? I mean, this is Moore's law level type stuff, right? You know, we've gotten bored with semiconductors, even though they're still pushing the boundaries of known physics and stuff like that. But everybody's like, nah, I don't know. I guess they're, they're going to make another legacy right? industry that is inventing the future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like, dude, I don't think you fully understand what they're doing now. They're getting to the part now where they have to ask a question of when is an electron an electron? You it's know. funny, almost like now the semiconductor industry is becoming interesting after like 50 years of innovation and invention, right? And enabling the mobile computing revolution and the internet. And now we're talking about an exponentially more interesting technical challenges they need to deal with for the future. But we went deep and I want to go back to the depth of the conversation. But before that, I want to take a step back and actually give the audience a bit more context <clears throat> on why this conversation is already interesting and going to be even more interesting. And the question I have for you is, how did you get to work on quote unquote metaverse at McKinsey? And what was sort of in your background that ultimately led you to enter into the space and made it relevant for you as you brought and worked on it in McKinsey? Well, so the short answer is I'm a classic beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission person. And so when the Oculus Go came out in about 20, I think, was it 18, 17, something like 20, 2018, I think, uh, which, you know, got a suitcase with like 20 of them here. You know, if anybody needs an Oculus Go, let me know. But the key thing was that, is that it, it was an incredible amount of performance for an incredibly low price. For $199, you got a three degree of freedom system that had all sorts of great stuff, con integrated controllers, all sorts of great stuff, right? And basically what I did was I said, okay, look, there's something about this that is the future. McKinsey does not have anything that does this. And so I spent some of my own money building prototypes to understand how does this work. And then I went back to some people and I said, right, 
you know, it's a white space. Nobody's covering it. I'm planting my pole on this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to lead this. And on the one hand, that all sounds, you know, very romantic and, you know, and adventurous and all that stuff. But the thing that you have to understand is that if it had not developed, I probably would have been told within a year or two to go back to my day job. Right. You know, nice. Okay, great. You did this, but nothing came out of it. And so go back. So whenever anything new comes up, so for example, like the whole like generative text and graphics and video world that's happening now, which is really just statistics-based software. I wish people would stop calling it artificial intelligence, just call it statistics-based software. That's certainly an area where people could plant a flag. You could say, hey, I'm going to be the leader in understanding the business impact of generative graphics for insurance companies, right? I mean, you just pick those two things. And you go out there and you do hard work and you spend a lot of time researching things. You build prototypes. Sometimes you have to build them yourself because nobody's going to give you the money to do it. And that's either te learn the tools and work late nights or open up your wallet and throw some money at it. Like I do. And I went and found people and spent 50 bucks here and a hundred bucks there and got people to build some prototypes for things that I could see how they worked. And then you really get that understanding of what business problem, meaning a numerical financial problem, does this really move the needle on, you know? And honestly, for, I'm just going to make it up on the spot. So let's say you've got generative AI for il illustrations. So things like we've seen, like with like the diffusion models and all that stuff. And you'd say, okay, for the insurance industry, how is this going to help? It's like, okay, well, what if, you know, when something happens, you take a photograph of it and this thing is able to figure out what it is it's looking at and able to come back and offer four different reparation concepts on the spot and say, hey, if you want to fix this, let's say your car gets smashed in, like, hey, we can, you know, here's four different ways that we can imagine the reparations being done and which one does the adjuster pick as being correct, that kind of stuff. It's probably, somebody's gonna call up and say, that's a horrible example, but you get the point. It's like, okay, the problem it would solve is shortening the cycle time from a problem to a, an adjuster making a decision to allocating capital to getting the money to the client to them picking your insurance company versus the competitor because you get the money faster, right? And you, of course, are happier with the risk profile of the answer you gave. So that's a way to go after that. But anyway, long story short, go find a white space, jump into the white space, be prepared to be fired. And then if it works out, you get to call yourself the leader of that sector. Sounds like a great plan, noted. So Richard, yeah. right now, what are the main opportunities that businesses should consider in the metaverse space as nascent as it is in the short term, knowing that there is a lot of evolution of the technology, either in the 2.5 version that you've mentioned, as you think of Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite, and so more in kind of the next few years, two, three years, what are the most concrete opportunities you think businesses are looking at? or needs they can solve with this emerging space? And what are a couple of example of use cases that you believe are already happening and you find compelling? Yeah, so I think, remember my definition of this is full body computing. And so the question of it is what are business uses where the ability for people to do this is really gonna make a difference? And especially people coming together and all of them doing this where is it going to make a difference? So the one thing I'd like to say is that I think that the Quest Pro and the Pico Neo 4 Pro Enterprise are the first feature complete full body computing systems. They are cordless, so they're standalone. They have high enough frame rates and resolutions and field of view, but the, they can do hand tracking. So without wearing controllers, they can track what your hands are doing. And now they've both added both eye tracking and face tracking. And this is important. Because what the Quest 2 and that generation allowed us to do was motion at a distance. So if you were in a headset and I was in a headset, and let's say we were playing Population 1, if you raised your arm, I could see that you raised your arm. If you pointed to the left, I could see you pointed to the left. So you and I could fully see motion at a distance in a way that is not constrained by the frames of video conferencing. And of course, the more people you have in video conferencing, the smaller the frames get. So it's harder for us to really pick up the fine resolution of motion, right? You're doing that. If I use my hands a lot to talk, you get more sense of it. I can point to things and it means something. 
With the addition of the eye tracking and the face tracking, what they are also going to allow is the second big piece is emotion at a distance. So if you and I are having a conversation in the metaverse and we're both wearing full body tracking systems and you start saying something and I start doing this with my body, right? And my eyebrows furrow and my mouth goes down, you're good old 100,000 year old analog mammal detection system, remember eye-based, 80% is eye-based, is going to pick up on the fact that I'm not loving whatever it is you're saying. And that you and I now have kind of a, a, a problem, a communications problem, right? Or a convincing problem. And video conferencing does that if there's just the two of us. But as soon as you add four people or five people, the pictures get too small and blah, 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 blah. But if you have seven or eight people in a circle in full body computing, you can completely look around and see who's loving it and who's hating whatever it is that you're talking about, right? And so, okay, well, if that's what you can do, what can you do this for in business that matters? <clears throat> Number one, the easiest thing that I'm recommending to everybody in the world is that if you have an agile software development team that is fully remote, everybody's in different cities, countries, whatever, Go buy full body computing systems and do have them do the ad the daily stand up meeting because you get the two things. Do you guys use agile for your stuff? We do. Okay. Do you use when you were all in the office? Did you all use like sticky notes or do you do it all now in like you know one of these Canva? Type well, things? we we started a company fully remote, but we do use Miro for do sticky okay. notes on a white for virtual yes, sticky notes. exactly virtual sticky notes right. But the key thing with an agile meeting, of course, is moving the sticky notes to backlog or to deliverable or to testing or all that kind of stuff, right? But the second piece of it is the reason it's a stand-up meeting and everybody's there is that sort of like a group consensus of things. So if somebody moves a sticky note, so you've got motion, I go up, it's my turn, I take up my sticky note and I say, I'm moving this into testing, right? It's ready to go. And I look around and I see that you're going like this, you know, that's very important information that is hard to get through video conferencing and 2D, 2.5D systems. And then that then allows someone to say, hey, Jan, you don't seem to be loving the idea that Richard says this module's ready for testing. And you're like, because it isn't, man. I mean, we haven't, you know, blah, 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 you know, and you get into it. And then you and I get into a huge argument and everybody else is having a great time because they're watching this like a tennis match, like in the real world which is motion and emotion. And everybody gets this much greater bandwidth and feel out of what's going on, cohesiveness, capabilities, and those things. So if you've got a remote agile team, go buy everybody, either the Neo 4s or the Quest Pros, start doing your 15 minute daily agile meetings in this. And I guarantee you, you will see a change in performance and cohesiveness of the team and understanding of each other, right? And all for the price of an airplane ticket which you probably are going to pay for to bring everybody together at least once a year anyway, right? And the thing, the other benefit of this is that since it's a daily meeting, people get used to it. And since it's short, right? Nobody has to put on the nerd helmet for eight hours straight or any of these other fantasies. It's like, look, I'm going to pop it on. It's a half an hour meeting we have every day. We get together. And then while everybody's waiting for everybody to show up, what do people do? They tell jokes. They screw around, Right. They ask each other about their weekends. They do all this kind of like socializing stuff while they're waiting for everybody to show up and then start the meeting, right? So that works perfect. The second one that works really well is anybody who's in the sort of like, let's call it physical deliverables world. Whether you are delivering a new 3D mouse for a client or you are decorating rooms or redesigning buildings or stalker stadiums or whatever, being able to you and your client physically walk the facility in a human scale and be able to look at details is immeasurably valuable because humans are horrible at looking at plans and renders and making good decisions about spatial volumetric systems. So I had heard, I've heard of a company that a client company that designs restaurants. So let's say you've been running a restaurant for 15 years and you decide you want to redesign the interior and make it, you know, modern style. 
architectural company, they come in, they redesign the whole thing. They now, my understanding from somebody I talked to, they now require all clients to put on a VR headset and do a one-to-one -one walkthrough of the proposed renovation before they will accept the client's sign-off. So the client cannot sign off on a PowerPoint. The client cannot sign off on renders. The client cannot sign off on any of these things. The client must experience the thing because they would get feedback like, oh, I didn't realize that the lights were going to be that high off the ceiling. I thought the chandeliers were going to be lower over the bar, right? And everybody said, well, it was in the renders. He said, yeah, but humans don't think that way versus when they're in there and they can see that. Oh, yeah, I mean, kind of, I thought that was going to be bigger. I thought that was going to be smaller. I thought that was going to be more blue. I thought that was going to be blah, 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 right? And this, if you have ever done a business where you're working in the physical world and change orders makes your life a living hell, at the very least, it reduces that for a certain cycling of things. And I fully believe that if you're in any of these industries where you're designing a new physical product with the client, where you're designing a new physical space, and you're getting something that's never existed before or a modification of it, for God's sake, spend the money, learn how to do this, FedEx out the headset to the client if that's what you need to do. I, By the way, I also fully recommend you go do something like go to a basketball court and have somebody set it up so that it's full one-to-one -one scale so that if they need to walk 20 meters and then turn 10 meters, set it up so they fully walk 10 and 20 meters because that human scale of everything and not having to do teleporting and clicking and all that stuff is immeasurably valuable. And that's what I mean by like, we're really into a full body computing paradigm shift. It's the early days. And these are the kinds of things that are starting to become enabled. And I'm hearing about the early days of people doing this stuff. And for me, there's a key keyword, which is transformation, which is there was the day before and then the day after. And for all of us, I can guarantee you, if you've ever traveled, there was the day before and the day after Uber, right? Because you remember you used to have to call a taxi company and ask them to pick you up to go to the airport in the morning. And maybe they wrote down the address wrong, or you couldn't tell if there was any taxis coming. And it was just a horrible experience, right? Versus now you just get up, see how many cars are available, decide if you're going to take a shower before you push the button or after, push the button, see them go downstairs, you're ready to go, right? Is anybody who has used Uber gone back to calling a taxi company willingly? So that was a transformation. So in these areas, these couple of groups and companies and industries that I've talked to where they're, they've really seen what this thing is, they're not going back because the value of this, and it's a very small thing. In fact, I call these million dollar minutes, right? That if you've got your agile team together for 15 minutes and you avoid a million dollar mistake, it's hard to say it wasn't worth it. You know, same thing. You can imagine that if somebody's renovating an apartment or a restaurant and they see something like, oh, well, we need to change the materials. That's a million dollar problem right there solved in a couple of minutes because you could actually see it. And I think so, it's really, I think so, it's really, and I think it's really well aligned with some incredible initiatives and platforms that are being built. I had Rev Liberidian from NVIDIA who runs the simulation group and Omniverse. I think they're doing something phenomenal in really enabling that large scale collaborations in designing cars. I mean, we've seen what they've done with Autobahn in Germany, right? The largest rail network in enabling them to really simulate what things could look like and collaborate in an immersive way. And I think what you're describing, these full body computing let's call it form factor, are going to play a role in really allowing people to not only do that virtually, but actually be embedded in these virtual spaces. And through that, either increase the value or decrease the cost or both, and creating completely new value proposition and economic engines of how things are being done, designed, built, made, serviced. Switching gears to a different topic where there's been a lot of confusion, still is, about how the metaverse and Web3 are connected, if at all. And what is Web3? And is it Web3 or is it Web3.0? So, so, I like, you know. The, yeah, the, yeah. So let's call it block. Let's, it's basically it's blockchain technology. Well, the way I think about it, right, in my mind. You've got, you've got blockchain technology and there's all of these derivatives that are built on top. Well, in right? my mind, 
I can subscribe to that. I mean, in my mind, if the metaverse is about the evolution of the internet from 2D to 3D using full body computing technologies, form factors, et cetera, Web3 slash blockchain is potentially about the evolution of the internet from centralized ecosystems to decentralized ecosystems. And in a way, may or may not feed one another. But of course, in the grand scheme of thing, when people think about the metaverse in the future, or at least being inspired by what it could be, People talk about a network of virtual world that are synchronous, persistent, where I can carry my identity with me and own the digital assets. And people would talk about a user-owned internet and so on and so forth. But I want to get your perspective and see how do you think about those two things separately, but also how do they feed one another over time? So we've probably seen a lot of charts. In fact, I think we made one which is like three ring diagrams, right? You've got head mounted computing, virtual immersive computing, visualization systems, massive multiplayer games, and then web three, usually it's the third one, right? And the key thing about this is everything that I've described about full body computing, right? Looking at architectural diagrams, doing stand up meetings, hanging out with your friends with space dolphins, you don't need web three to build any of it. It doesn't, Web3 doesn't solve any technical problems for that set of problems, solutions, right? So now that doesn't mean that Web3 doesn't have value or the concepts of it or the blockchain based technology. But my key point is that it's going to, it needs to earn its seat at the table. And at the moment, what I'm hearing is a lot of people just demanding it have a seat at the table. You know, it's like, well, because, for example, like this whole question of centralization or decentralization, that's not a technical problem. That's a socioeconomic aspirational problem, right? Decentralizing social networks, like, you know, it's not going to make Facebook run faster. That's not a problem that it's not going to help Facebook store things cheaper or any of those types of things. So you would look at these types of systems and you say, what is the core technical problem? of which technology only solves two problems. It's either things are faster or cheaper. There is no better in technology. It's just faster or cheaper. There's really only two, those two things. And so you'd say applicational blockchain technology, does it make any of these problems faster or cheaper? Right? Now, interestingly enough, and people are not gonna like this, Bitcoin, right? certainly made it faster and cheaper to execute non, let's call them non-regulated transactions, financial transactions, right? And so if you want to go outside of the established regulatory framework for finance and you wanted to do some transactions, it certainly was faster because it used to have to be that you'd have to like, ship an entire airplane full of cash from Miami back to Medellin, right? And that was slow and certainly cheaper, right? Because if the cut was usually for money laundering was around 30%, here was a way for you to reduce that down to maybe 20%, basic losses and stuff like that, right? So certainly for that use case, it was like a fairly reasonable technical solution. But when you start scaling it out to a variety of other things that people are working on and where things are, I understand the socioeconomic desire to be able to take your stuff from one place to another because you paid for it, right? But look around us in the real world. That's not how things work in the real world. Jan, can you go to a casino in Vegas and bring four aces with you, even though you bought the deck of cards at the drugstore across well, the street? Well, that would be wonderful, casino? but I don't think it's possible. Right. But physically, of course, you could, right? But there's other reasons why that's just not a good idea, right? Same thing. If you go to a movie theater, can you go to a movie theater and bring four course dinner and two bottles of wine with you to the movie that's theater? That's another wonderful idea, but the answer is no. Yeah. Okay. And the reason is that the people who put all the capital into the movie theater and building out, so they make their money off of selling popcorn and, over, and soda pop and candy and all that kind of stuff, right? They make some money from the tickets, but they make a lot more money from selling the other stuff. So their business model says, hey, if you want to be able to see, because otherwise, and a couple of people have tried this, say, hey, you want to not have to deal with that. We'll let you bring your own stuff, but movie tickets cost $38 each. And people are like, I don't want to pay $38 for a movie ticket. It's like, okay. 
then how about you pay $11 for the movie ticket and I make the rest of the money off of the candy and the soda pop and the beer that I sell there, right? And I end up, you know, where I need to be economically, you know? And so I think there's this case of, hey, this is what I want. And then you look around and you say, okay, well, unfortunately, there's a lot of businesses out there. That's just not how they work. Fortnite's a good example. Fortnite is free to play. Actually, Roblox, your area, of the, your area of the universe. It is free to play. But, you know, and they make money on things that people voluntarily pay for. They aren't forced to buy anything, right? Well, then why would they allow people to import skins from the outside? You know? They're like, look, we're giving you a billion dollars worth of server space to go play the game for free, and we've got another way to make the money, right? And so why is that horrible? Why is that a bad thing? Why is that some sort of evil corporation, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, you know, okay. It's just, it's a business model thing. It's a business model choice. If somebody is able, and by the way, there will be somebody out there that is going to open a game or a world or whatever in which you can import all your own stuff. Absolutely. No problem. Right. But they're going to have to make money some other way. And so it's either going to be advertising or it's going to be subscription fees or ticket prices or selling your data or something else. So you can get what you want, but if that's, but they're going to do something else to make money, and you're probably not going to like that. And Web three is well. I think the challenge. Is, I think the you challenge know. with what yeah. has happened so far with Web three, blockchain, crypto, NFTs, etc. In my mind, is that in order for in order for you to play, you need to pay. In order for you to engage in NFTs, play a game, you're starting by purchasing something that is not cheap at all. And even if it is cheap. There is the gas fees that are added because of the inefficiency of how, you know, blockchains work at the moment. But I don't have a problem with that. So, for example, let's say, do you like, do you like to do long distance bicycle riding? I don't. I fantasize about it as an exercise sometime, but I never do it. Okay. But if you were going to do long distance bicycle riding, you've got to buy a bicycle. Yeah, pay right? to play is not a bad thing. It happens all the time. I have a rowing machine at home, which I love dearly. If I want to row, I need to purchase. Right. But the difference is, but the difference is nobody says buy this bicycle. Correct. It's going to be worth more later. Correct. That's it's where true. The line, and that's I agree with you. I think that's crossed. the problem because it's one thing to say, buy something to play, which I think a lot of people will can understand. And then they may, they can make the choice. It's, a, it's, it, the price is fine for me, et cetera. I think the challenge with what happened so far is that, it all became a financial instrument mechanism. And the reality is that most people in the world, I don't have the data or the facts, but I assume, I suspect that most people around the world don't want to engage all day long with everything that they can do on the internet through something that is of a, some sort of a financial instrument, especially look what happens when the stock market goes down. People are going ballistic about it, right? And sell and they lose confidence. Imagine what happens when we financialize the entire internet and suddenly everything goes up and down like crazy. That's not something that I think most humans or people want to deal with. And so when I saw, you know, six, nine months ago that within five years, 90% of the video game industry is going to be play to earn. I was like, that is literally impossible because if that was the case, then every single human around the world would have traded stocks and would have done investments and would have felt comfortable. And the reality is that it's not, it doesn't happen. And so why would we turn every single entertainment or leisure exercise into day, not even yes. just financial day trading? Right. And I'm sure you have got friends who really got into day trading. Right. And they were super enthusiastic up front and they're telling you what an idiot you were. were and now they're most of them <laughs> sleeping on your couch. It turns out day trading yeah. is hard and dangerous. So is betting on the ponies at the racetrack. So is playing poker for as your job. You know, there's all these sorts of things where you start throwing money into the system. It's not, they're not designed for you, for most people to win. You know, and it's like, it's the old thing, like the casinos of Vegas are not built with winner's money. And so that's where, by the way, you know, with NFTs, I think, I think the thing that we should do, the core technology of NFTs, I think has value for humanity. And that core technology is the following. Whenever you buy anything at a store, you get a little piece of paper called a, what's it called, Jan? 
When a you receipt. buy something in a store. Exactly. If we renamed NFTs to universal receipt system. So if I buy something electric, digital or physical, and, it, and I, my wallet is connected to the transaction and I get a receipt for it, right? That says that this object, whether it's digital or physical, is associated with this record, this transactional record. And then in the future, if I want to go back to the store and say, hey, this thing's broken, give me another one, what do they ask for? They ask for the receipt. They don't care about the broken item. It's the receipt that matters, right? And so then if in the future, I wanted to sell you this on Craigslist, I could sell it to you for a dollar without or $2 with the receipt. Because then in the future, you could go to the store and get it fixed if it broke. So the receipt has economic value. Everybody here has got some sort of thing where something broke two years later and you're trying to find the receipt through your credit card records or this, that, or the other to be able to go back to Best Buy or somebody and blah, 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 blah. So a universal receipt system, which is what NFT technology is, it's a ledgering system for transactions, right, would have incredible value for humanity. You know, and I think that is one of the things where I look, by the way, I remember I said that Web3 just needs to earn its seat at the table, right? I didn't say it was useful, wasn't useful, blah, 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 blah. Here is a way for it to earn its seat at the table. Now, if I had the system where like every transaction I did, everything I bought and sold, whether it was credit cards or cash or whatever, and I ended up with a digital receipt for it, built into this, that, or the other, it'd be incredibly valuable. Now, the downside that people don't think about is who else would find this very interesting and valuable? The Internal Revenue Service, the tax man, right? Because he'd be able to, you know, they'd be able to say, okay, Jan, we looked at your wallet and it looks like you spent $140,000 this year, but you said you only had income of $42,000. Where'd the rest of it come from, Jan? And, but then the, the other risk, of course, is that if you're in a oppressive regime, like let's say Iran, they'd be able to see all these transactions too, right? And they'd be able to ask, hey, we noticed that you purchased a Starlink dish. We don't like that. We're gonna come visit, you know, that type of stuff. So, you know, it's one of the good and bad, right? It certainly could be very valuable in many ways. Well, we're definitely in the discovery risky, phase you know, of that. But I think the initial example we've seen of how it's being used, not many of them make sense. And I think that's sort of what no, because they're mixing two things, right? They're mixing what is the value of digital art with a universal receipt system, right? So you've got art in general, which is like, hey, is this painting going to be worth a lot in the future or not? Is it worth something now? Is it worth something more in the future? With the digital component of it versus, like, let's say, the analog physical component and then the universal receipt system, the NFT technology for matching those things. And they're mixing all of these three things around. And so what we got into was an argument about whether pictures of monkeys are worth $4 million combined with a technical system for keeping track of receipts. And the two of these things got mixed together in the common discussion and everything, you know, that's why I'm saying rebrand the NFT technology as a universal receipt system and let it move on and help everybody. And then we can still keep talking about whether digital art is valuable or not. So we'll let's switch gears. Side. I want to talk about decision makers. CEOs are going to make important decisions in the next couple of years about what the metaverse means for their company. How do you believe they can de-risk the bets that they're making? And what would be your recommendation as to the most effective ways that you believe they can enter the space and start experimenting and learning? So I do believe that these examples that I've discussed earlier is basically in the early days, look for million dollar minutes. Look for things where, hey, if everybody had all the technology and they were all educated up on it, so it wasn't the first time anybody used any of this stuff, what's a problem where if they spent 10 minutes on it, they actually would, something would be revealed to us either as a group or as informational that would be worth a million bucks. Right. And those are the kinds of areas to, I think, to focus on. And you can imagine that one area where this is very valuable is sales. So if you're in the industrial sales business or the engineered sales business or the real estate sales business or the mega yacht sales business or the anything that costs a million bucks, right? 
this is an area where you probably ought to start to get very good at having all the equipment together, the experiences, understanding the workflow, having users that are trained on this, go to your clients, make it a white glove concierge situation where all they have to do is go to a hotel, the ballroom has been rented for them, there's a piece of tape that says stand here, somebody puts the headset on them, shows them all they have to do is move their hands and walk, that's all they got to do. And then somebody digitally from halfway around the world is in the world and is walking with them to do the sales pitch, right? And it doesn't matter what it is. I just think it's anything worth more but than a million bucks. do you think when something costs, more costs than a so bucks? much, wouldn't it make sense that you can actually go and invest more in either a travel or what's the added value beyond? Time, time is money. Like for example, I come from the oil business, right? Oil projects in the oil business have price tags of like $30 billion. We, and I, the following statement is an exaggeration, but it's not a real exaggeration. The oil business is so busy and doesn't have enough people. They give billion dollar project budgets to people that did not graduate from college. Right now, it's not saying they're not good managers. They're not this, that, or the other, but the view of like, oh, well, if it's that important, you know, blah, 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 blah. it's like, no, it's just like, look, if you deal in big numbers, in fact, the guy, I tell you, the person who's managing the billion dollar budget project absolutely would not get on an airplane to go look at a $1 million piece of equipment, right? That they've got a thousand other things that are worth a mm -hmm. million dollars they need to mm -hmm. be working on, you know? And so... That's why I'm saying you'll find the industries that right. have this problem. And this is the thing where like, Jan, I'm not talking about consumers. For consumers, a million dollars is a lot of money. For people in the industrial world, a million dollars is not a lot of money. And a million dollars from a budgetary standpoint, right? And a million dollars could be, you know, like a thing of like, okay, so let me get this straight. You want me to spend two days to fly to China to go hang out in Guangzhou, well, if you could get there nowadays, I guess it's still kind of travel difficult, but back in the day, or you want me to go to Singapore, right? Because the manufacturer has a demo unit on the floor in their factory in Singapore, and you want me to fly two days to Singapore, spend a day on the ground or two days on the ground, spend another day flying back, all to look at this one sort of thing. And we know that the walk around really is only gonna take about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, to look at the machine, see how it works, push a couple buttons, blah, 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 blah. Is it gonna fit through the door on the installation? Why not do this, walk around in my conference room, I'll see this out of the other, I can see everything that I need to see, I can ask the questions, you got four or five experts there from all over the world, you didn't have to fly all these people in for this, that, or the other, blah, blah, blah. We ask the questions, we answer them, and away we go, you know? And so that is where I think that case is if your company sells anything that's like a physical product, whether that's an installation or a physical good, and the price tag is like over a million dollars or it's an engineering service or something like that, absolutely look into this and then go create a white glove concierge service for your customers so that they don't have to do anything but just pop it on, walk around, talk to you and get the answer. You'll make money on this. Great timing to move into the last question that I like to wrap up every episode with, Richard, which is what's the one thing you want people to take away from the conversation today? That it is early days, and I'm sorry Zuckerberg promised you the future available this afternoon, right? It's an engineering technical problem. It's a software problem. It's a people learning how to do things differently problem. We're in the early days. We're quite honestly, if you remember, mobile phones were in the BlackBerry era, you know, of things. And who had Blackberries? Financial services people, CEOs had Blackberries, right? Because they dealt with million dollar problems, right? And so for them, it was a valuable tool that paid for itself and made all those things kind of work. So we're in those early days. You know, if you expect that your $10,000 problem should be fully addressable or $100 problem should be fully addressable at the moment, not really. We need to come down the curve. And that means that we need to get to probably, if the Quest Pro and the Neo 4 are feature complete, we probably need to get two generations past them to get to the iPhone 4 equivalent. And the reason the iPhone 4 is every phone after the iPhone 4 is an iPhone 4, 
right? Look at this feature. Look at the form factor. That's exactly a iPhone 4 form factor. The features it has in it, there's nothing different. It's just stuff's better. More cameras, better screens, better bandwidth, worse battery life, blah, 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 blah. But they're all iPhone 4s. And we're not at the iPhone 4 yet. Great place to finish and wrap up. Richard, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I think it was fascinating. We covered a lot of ground and definitely there's going to be a follow-up conversation. So thanks for being with me here today. Absolutely. And I'll just do a plug for myself, Richard Ward, the venture altruist. If you are a startup founder and you would like McKinsey quality help for free, go for it. Give me Thank a call. you, Richard. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Into the Metaverse. We hope you learned a lot and explored new aspects of the metaverse.